Okay, uh, thank you. So we're going to switch topics again. So last time uh, we were talking about minimal surfaces, and minimal surfaces were critical points for the area functional. So now we're going to uh, look at the associated uh, negative gradient flow. So instead of, um, right, and so, so here, so this is the mean curvature flow. So now uh, we look at a one parameter family of, of hypersurfaces. So it would always, always be hypersurfaces. Uh, in Rn plus 1, uh, sigma t, t is the parameter there. And it, we're going to, um, at each point, we're going to move the hypersurface in, the nor in a normal direction with speed equal to minus the mean curvature. So recall the first variation formula. So when we were deriving the equation for a minimal surface, um, we checked in general if you had, had any variation of a, of a surface, then how did the area or, area or volume vary along the family? So we got the formula that the, the derivative of volume was given by um, the mean curvature dotted with the variation. So in this case, we've chosen the variation to be exactly equal to the other term. So this is the most efficient way to, uh, to decrease the volume. And this is, so this is the negative gradient flow or, or steepest descent. And so this is mean, uh, mean curvature flow. Obviously, if h is equal to 0, this says that the hypersurface doesn't change. So minimal surfaces are the fixed points or static solutions of the flow. OK, so again, as we did in, in the last two, we're, we're sort of building towards a dynamical picture. We'd like to understand um, what happens to the flow. Uh, in this case, there'll be a new phenomenon uh, in that there will be all sorts of new singularities. So it, for the heat equation, there were no singularities at all, and we were moving towards a, a harmonic function. In the curve shortening flow, um, at least in the embedded case, then Grayson showed the only singularities were these shrinking circles. So if you got near, you know, as long as you started off with something compact. If you, I notice compactness is important there because otherwise you could have something like a Grim Reaper um, arising. But, but it, as long as you have, have something compact, the only thing that can go wrong is it becomes, for curves, Grayson showed it becomes extinct at a point, and it's a round point, meaning if you look near that point and scale it back up, you see something very circular. Okay, so here there'll be new phenomena. Okay, so, huh. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so first, uh, to connect it up with the, just what the PDE looks like. Uh, so here's uh, what the mean curvature flow for graphs would look like. So recall we computed the mean curvature of a graph when we were checking the minimal, well, we recalled the computation of the mean curvature of a graph when we were computing, uh, when we were looking at the mi minimal surface equation. So here, the mean curvature is given by the divergence of this grad u over the square root of 1 plus grad u squared with that minus sign in front. So uh, mean curvature flow of graphs, you get the following formula. Um, naively, perhaps, you might imagine that uh, it should not have this, this uh, square root of 1 plus grad u squared there on the right. Uh, the reason that is there is because of when the flow of graphs, the, you think of the graphs as moving in the vertical direction, but the vertical direction is not normal to the graph necessarily unless the gradient is zero. This factor corrects for the fact that, that the vertical direction is not normal. And just to remind you, we already saw one solution of the, uh, the graphical mean curvature flow, and, and that was Calabi's Grim Reaper, uh, where u of x and t was given by t minus log of sine t. That's a very special solution in that it's a translator. Uh, as time changes, the only thing is that the graph uh, translates vertically at unit speed. <coughs> okay, so what are the, the basic examples? Well, we already, uh, of course, any minimal surface is a static solution, so that gives a very simple example, um, or a class, a large class of simple examples of the flow. Uh, the other examples, uh, just like in the, the uh, Okay, so the other basic examples, you have shrinking spheres, shrinking cylinders, and planes. Uh, the spheres, again, that's, those become extinct in, in a round point. I mean, each of them is round. The cylinders, again, become extinct. These are given by lower dimensional spheres crossed with R, uh, you know, or, or R to a factor. Those um, in R3, the cylinders become extinct along a line. So you get a whole line of singularities there at the singular time. And of course, planes are a, a static solution. These figures are, of course, done by Matthias. <laughs> okay, so those, uh, right, so, oh, whoops. 
that would be good. All right, so now um, the spheres and cylinders are an example of a class of solutions uh, uh, which are called self, self shrinkers or self similar shrinkers. So uh, Andre spoke about these in the, in, in the Lagrangian case, and, and previously I talked about uh, you know, an example of that in the other case, uh, in the curve shortening case, where Abresch and Langer classified all such solutions. So here, what does it mean to be a self shrinker? It just means that over time, the mean curvature flow evolves by homothetes. So sigma at time t is given by the square root of minus t times sigma at minus one. So this family, um, as t goes to zero, it, it shrinks off and disappears. Um, and then for positive t, the, the flow is empty. And one example of a self shrinker were these spheres of radius square root of minus two nt. Another example would be cylinders, again, of the appropriate radius. Uh, so the cylinder would be of uh, radius well, I guess that gives the example, right? N equal one gives the radius for cylinders. So, so uh, as I said, Abresch and Langer gave a classification and in the embedded, in the curve shortening flow and in the embedded case, the only thing that you got were these shrinky circles. Uh, unfortunately, in higher dimensions, a complete classification, even in the embedded case, appears to be impossible. So there appear to be just way too many of these to, to classify. Let me talk about um, so I say that. So it's a strange situation. On the one hand, we say that there are way too many to possibly classify. On the, o the other hand, we only know like three. <laughs> so that's not necessarily consistent, but, but we'll see why that's the case. So here's the only uh, self-shrinker we know that, that uh, isn't on the previous list of, of spheres and cylinders. This is called anginant shrinking donut. So what is this? This is um, it's a self -shrinking, a self similarly shrinking torus. And it's a torus of rotation. So here I've drawn a, a cross section. So we imagine this z-axis is the axis of rotation. Here you have this uh, closed curve in the plane. And if you just take this curve and rotate this around the z-axis, uh, you would get a donut. This donut moves under the flow by homothetes. So this is a, a say, time uh, minus one uh, picture of the donut. It disappears at the origin when time is equal to zero, and each uh, step in between, it's just given by rescaling this picture about the origin. Okay, so this, uh, okay, so by the way, how would you find this, uh, something like this? Well, if you look at, at, at self-similar solutions, uh, then those end up being, uh, they end up being geodesics for a funny metric in the plane. So these are found, uh, solutions like this are found by, by solving for the geodesics for that metric. Okay, so a few, a few properties. I um, just want to remind you of a few properties for the mean curvature flow. One of the things that, that, that one uses over and over again is the parabolic maximum principle. So, um, of course, for the heat equation, the linear heat equation, that would say that if you have some, some domain, and suppose you have a solution that's positive at the initial time, and it remains positive along the boundary, then it will be positive everywhere. So, for uh, mean curvature flow, this parabolic maximum principle pops up over and over again. W the one thing that it's used for is it's used to show that if you have two uh, closed hypersurfaces that are initially disjoint, then they remain disjoint under the flow. Uh, so there cannot be a first point of contact between them. Uh, second, uh, and a co basically a corollary to that is that if you have one that is embedded, then it remains embedded under the flow because it can't have a first point of contact with itself. The second thing this is used for and so this goes back to Huiskin, is that if, if uh, the initial surface is convex, then it remains convex under the flow. Uh, third, uh, mean convexity is preserved under the flow. By the way, how, you know, we'll see later why, why, well, I'll just say now why that would be. The mean curvature satisfies uh, a heat equation. So it, instead of um, the ordinary heat equation, it, it satisfies one which is like the, second, the analog of the second variation operator, where you have a mod a squared thr uh, thrown in. And so then, if it's at positive at an initial time, it has to remain so under the flow. And so all of those things are, are proven with the, the parabolic maximum principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just keep it closed, right? Okay, so um, Grayson's dumbbell. All right, so now we were saying, right, okay, so um, this is an example of Grayson from, from 19... Uh, 89, uh, which, which shows, which gave the, the first example of showing that 
you know, his wonderful theorem for curves does not hold in higher dimensions. So for curves, he showed that if you have any embedded curve, simple closed curve in the plane, it eventually becomes convex and then Gage Hamilton takes over. Uh, so that is not the case in higher dimensions. So this, think, this is actually a, re a rotationally symmetric dumbbell. So this is a surface in R3. It's topologically a sphere. And if the bells are large enough and the neck is long and thin enough, then it hits this pinching singularity, this neck pinch, uh, before it hits extinction. So um, Anginet gave a, a new proof of, of that result using his shrinking donut. Let me describe how that is, and then also and you'll see why I reminded you what the maximum principle was uh, on the previous slide. So now imagine, right, so imagine that inside this bell you put a large sphere, inside that bell you put another large sphere, and then around this, uh, the bar part, you encircle it with uh, Anginet's shrinking donut of a certain size. Okay, so you can, you can do that if you make, and now all four of those surfaces are initially disjoint. If, if the shrinking donut encircles this neck such that it, it misses it, or it misses you know, the, the bar part, then that's disjoint, it, and these two spheres we make disjoint from there. So, okay, so those are four surfaces, four initial surfaces. <coughs> By the maximum principle, they remain disjoint. Now, if these bells are large enough, then I can put large spheres in there, which are still alive when the uh, shrinking donut has already become extinct. And so that extinction of the shrinking donut pinches off the, the bar there. So there must have been, uh, somehow it must have separated before these um, two spheres had disappeared. And so that proves that, that you must have had this singularity, this disconnecting singularity. Uh, which, um, okay, so Altschuler, Anginet, and Giga analyzed uh, all of these rotationally symmetric situations, and they showed that uh, the singularity that occurs there was actually, if you rescaled and looked right before that singularity occurred, what you would see was something that looked very much like shrinking cylinders, which is not at all surprising from the picture because this looks a lot like a cylinder. Okay, so those are the, the flows that, um, that's the tangent flow that arises there. Because this is a new type of singularity, new meaning a singularity that did not arrive in the, in the curve case. Okay, so now we'd like to, uh, the goal now, so there, there are these singularities, the goal now is to try to understand these singularities. So um, the, in the last three lectures, I'd like to concentrate on proving two results uh, about these singularities. The first is kind of a compactness theorem in R3. So we'll show that if you have some kind of bounds on the surface, like say a bound on the, the genus and the volume of the initial surface, then that implies a compactness for all possible singularities. So the set of singularities that might arise, um, you know, you can't necessarily list them, but they lie in a compact family. So I'd like to talk, explain that result. The second result I'd like to explain is a, a generic result, which, um, which very roughly stated, and I will state it more precisely later, says that, that the so the, the, the singularities that you expect to generically arise are actually in the families we've already listed. They're spheres and cylinders and generalizations of those. That's not limited to three dimensions. That's, that's in all dimensions. Okay, so in order to build to those results, I'm going to have to explain, uh, uh, introduce some concepts and explain how singularities are analyzed. So that's what we'll turn to now. So the most, um, um, okay, so We've seen the examples that we've seen so far that were self-similar, these all satisfy a nice equation. So now if you have a, one of these self-shrinkers where the flow at time t is just given by square root, a factor, a homothety square root of minus t times the flow at time minus one, well, if you're tracking the whole flow, you're obviously carrying around too much information. Uh, the flow at any given time uh, just looks like the flow at a later time scaled by a homothety. So let's look at the time minus one slice of that flow. And we'll see that those satisfy a nice equation. These completely t tell you every, everything you need to know. Okay, so the time minus one slices of this flow satisfy this self-shrinker equation that the mean curvature is equal to x dot n over two, that x dot n is sometimes called the support function. So x is the position vector in space, n is the unit normal. This is the equation that they satisfy. So uh, 
we'd la now like to um, understand these self-shrinkers. So what, are the what do the solutions of this look like? By the way, Andre was talking about uh, self-expanders. There you would throw a minus sign in front of the x.n. And that would be an expander. Uh, the Grim Reaper is a translator. That would satisfy addition, a different equation. In that case, h would be equal to x dot v. Um, and v, then, is the vector that it's translating along. OK, so now we'd like to understand self-shrinkers. So this equation, h equals x dot n over 2, um, so that, in order to understand that, you'd like to sort of understand that variationally. One way to do it is that you can see that those are actually the critical points for some functional. So one way to see that is that they're critical points for a funny Riemannian metric. So if you do a conformal change, and so instead of using the Euclidean metric, you multiply it by this conformal factor. I don't, don't know if you can see what it is, but it's e to the minus x squared over 2n. If you multiply the metric by that conformal factor, then the minimal surfaces in that metric are the self-shrinkers. So the equation that you get is h equals x dot n over 2. Uh, I'm sorry? That's the, uh, that's the metric on the ambient space. OK, so you, right, and then, uh, yeah. OK, so exactly, that, exactly. That's the metric on Rn plus 1. OK, so, um, well then, if you wanted to analyze self-shrinkers, you could just forget about mean curvature flow and just say, well, this is a problem in minimal surface theory, but in a Riemannian manifold, where the manifold has this Riemannian metric. Okay? And for some of us, like myself, that's a very happy thing. Right? Uh, you feel it sort of connects with something that you, you feel like you know very well. Um, so uh, it seems like a good thing. Uh, there are a couple of downsides to doing that. One is that this metric, you see with the exponential decay, this metric is not complete. You will reach infinity in some finite distance. Now, what you might hope in that case is that this is really, OK, so there are metrics where you reach infinity and finite dis distance, but they're not that bad. For instance, if you take R2 and under stereographic projection related to the sphere, you put the spherical metric on there. Well, on R2, it looks like that metric is not complete because infinity is at finite distance. But you can just add that point at infinity, and the whole thing becomes a, a nice smooth metric. This is not like that. If you compute the curvature of this metric, then you see that the curvature actually goes to infinity as you go to infinity. And in fact, it does so in a bad way. Um, the, there are sectional curvatures that go to both plus and minus infinity, depending on which planes you look at. OK, so I, I said before that we expect there to be too many self-shrinkers. And now, once you, you think of the self-shrinkers, you, you realize that they are um, minimal surfaces for some, some funny metric, well, if given a metric, you expect there to be an awful lot of minimal surfaces, right? So uh, you might, you know, may, there might be some restrictions, like if, say, you restrict the genus or you restrict the volume, then maybe there, there's a relatively small number. But, but if, uh, just in, if you allow all possible topological types, you certainly expect there to be an awful lot of them. Uh, so that's one reason why you expect there to be a lot. Oops. Okay, so now, but I said that there, there aren't too many examples rigorously known. Well, there are a lot of examples uh, for which there's numerical evidence. So basically, we have pictures of them, but people can't show that they, they exist. So these pictures are, uh, here are some pictures uh, created by David Chopp. Okay, the first one here. So this is a shrinking cube. Roughly speaking, what the, you start with an ordinary cube, and you bore out holes at each of the three coordinate axes. And then it's rounded a little bit. So this appears to move by homothetes under the mean curvature flow. And so the way that something like that is shown, uh, so the mean curvature flow is implemented numerically through the level set flow method, the sort of Osher and, and Sethian stuff. And so you just you do that, and you take the picture, and you look at it, and you compare the picture at one time to the pictures at the later time. You see that the pictures appear just to be magnification, homothetes of each other. And so therefore, you claim that this is probably very close to a, an exact solution. It's a numerical solution. So the second picture next to it is just half of the shrinking cube, just to give you a, another idea of what it looks like, the, the, the topology. OK, so here's another example. That, the first was a compact example. 
This is another example of, of numerical example of CHOP. This one is a cell shrinker that's asymptotic to a cone. So this is just a compact piece of it. And this one has some topology uh, glued in again. So it's, it's uh, generally, you can, you can actually show that if you have a self shrinker with some sort of control at infinity, then it has to be asymptotic to either a cylinder or a cone, at least in a weak sense, and measure theoretically. OK, so um, I'd like to talk about the analog of, of the gauge and Hamilton result. So for curve shortening flow, gauge and Hamilton showed convex curves become extinct at round points. The corresponding, that was, uh, the corresponding result was actually shown uh, in, all, in higher dimensions, was actually shown earlier by Huiskin. So he showed that if you, uh, under mean curvature flow, every closed convex hypersurface in Rn plus 1 remains convex, becomes, uh, you know, becomes almost round, and eventually becomes extinct in a round point. So it's a funny um, accident or you know, funny, uh, funny coincidence that the, the, his proof does not work for curves. The reason is that what he shows, um, in order to show that it becomes round, he shows that it becomes more and more umbilic. So a surface, a hypersurface is umbilic if all of the principal curvatures are the same. Okay, so for a curve, there is only one principal curvature, and being umbilic is, is not particularly unusual or special. Um, but for hypersurfaces in higher dimensions, then being umbilic forces you to either be, a, uh, if all the curvatures are zero, you become flat. If, if they're not, then you become round. Okay, so there's a, uh, okay, uh, Natasha uh, actually uh, analyzed the rates of convergence um, to the sphere. And I, I should add that uh, Felix Solcher has uh, shown that um, if you, the analog of this result, but instead of flowing by, by mean curvature, you can flow by other powers of mean curvature. By the positive powers of mean curvature. Okay, so there are other forms of convexity. Uh, that are preserved under the flow. Again, all of these are, it comes down, comes back to the, the parabolic maximum principle. So uh, mean convexity, so this is when the mean curvature has, has a sign, that is also preserved under the flow. And um, those singularities were analyzed by Huskin and Sinistrari and also by Brian White. Two convexity, so what does this mean? So you have your second fundamental form and you have these n principal curvatures. It's convex if every single one of them has the right sign. It's mean convex if the sum of them has the right sign. It's two convex if any pair added together has the right sign. Okay, so that uh, is also preserved under the, under the flow. In that case, again, Huiskin and Sinistrari have analyzed the singularities and they've shown that you can do a, a surgery um, to get rid of those singularities. So, or rather to avoid those singularities. Uh, so another sort of convexity that's preserved is, is being star-shaped. Um, right, and another uh, thing that's preserved under the flow is being a graph. Uh, there, you, you like some sort of control at infinity um, to make sure that, that things stay reasonable. By, that's Ecker and Huskin. In some cases, in some cases, it comes down to the equation it satisfies. Right, so all of these are proven by looking, okay, so how would you prove? So let's, so the simplest to explain is, is the convex case. So the mean curvature satisfies um, this analog, this parabolic analog of the second variation operator. So instead of Laplace, so this is like um, Simon's equation for uh, minimal hypersurfaces. Laplacian plus mod A squared applied to, you know, mod A, applied to A satisfies a nice equation for minimal surfaces. For mean curvature flow, you take the corresponding operator. So now it's like D, uh, dt, the t derivative, minus the Laplacian, minus mod A squared. And that applied to the mean curvature gives an, you know, uh, is equal to z uh, zero. Okay, and so that means it's this nice heat equation that the mean curvature satisfies. Now in a Ramanian manifold, you'll get extra terms in there. If things work out the right way, then, then things, you, you can show things are preserved. You just have to check in the corresponding situation. Okay, so those are special classes of solutions. Again, what, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to understand is not whether there are special classes of submanifolds, 
for which you can understand the singularity, but whether for an arbitrary submanifold, perhaps wiggled a little bit, you can understand the singularities. So I don't want to be forced to start with a convex surface. I'd like to be able to start with an arbitrary surface, but I'm going to allow myself the option of wiggling the, the initial surface. So I look for generic results. Okay, so now we're going to, um, while we're talking about convex things, I want to uh, again link up with uh, something we did the last time. So this was Burkhoff's idea of a sweep out. Okay, so let me just remind you about that. So here we have a closed convex surface in R3. And then um, since it's con uh, convex and closed, it's topologically a sphere. And I want to, uh, again, define this, this invariant called the width. So I'm going to define a, a, a sweep out for this. Okay, I should, I should sort of say where I'm going. So uh, we're still looking at this class of convex uh, hypersurfaces under the mean curvature flow. We know they all become extinct in round points. I'd like to talk about an estimate which gives you um, some hint of when it becomes extinct. So in certain cases, so the, they're, they're no, they all become extinct. You can estimate when they become extinct by various means. So for instance, the diameter gives you a bound on when they become extinct because just enclose it in a giant sphere. By the maximum principle, whatever you've enclosed in the giant sphere becomes extinct before the giant sphere does. However, suppose that you had a shape that was convex, but it was very long and skinny in one direction. It would have to be a really huge sphere to enclose it, which would indicate that it's a long time to extinction. However, you might be able to, to show the extinction more efficiently by enclosing it by somehow using this thinness in this other direction, okay? Uh, and that's the result I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so, um, right, so now that thinness we'll call the width. So here, uh, so imagine you have your convex, uh, this doesn't look very convex, but imagine you have your, your surface in, in uh, your spherical, topological sphere in R3, and I want to consider a one parameter family of curves, so in other words, a map from the cylinder uh, across zero, one. And I'm going to ask that the uh, bottom and top of the cylinder are collapsed to points, which makes this essentially a map from S2 to S2 topologically. And I'm going to ask that that map have degree 1. Something like that we'll call a sweep out. OK, so now what is the width? OK, so now we, we look at this. This is just like Camilla was, was defining before. Uh, so we look at this, uh, the, all of these sweep outs. We take, for each sweep out, we take the maximum of the energy of the curves. And then we take the infimum over all possible sweep outs. And so that's the width. And uh, just as Camilla was saying, it's very, it's, in this case, because they're curves, it's incredibly easy to show the width is positive. Um, and now what we'd like to understand is how that width changes under the flow. Okay, so first thing I want to just mention is that the width is a continuous function on the space of Ramanian metrics. If you, if you change the metric a little bit, the width changes a little bit. Um, the width turns out to be realized by a, a geodesic, and that's, that was Burkhoff's original interest in it. That's how he showed existence of geodesics on an arbitrary S2, S2 with an arbitrary metric. But that geodesic doesn't have to, to, even though the width changes continuously in the metric, the geodesic doesn't have to. So here's an example of showing how that, that could happen. Here are three snapshots of a one parameter family of, of metrics on a dumbbell. And what's happening is that uh, first, you imagine maybe both bells are, are small. You, one of them grows, the other stays fixed. Then the other one grows and catches up in size. And then the first one shrinks again. As that happens, the width, the, the geodesic realizing the width, jumps from one bell to the other. And at this transition point, it's realized by two distinct geodesics. This is. Okay, so now once you see that, you realize that, that the width, while it is continuous in the metric, is certainly not going to be any better than that. Because if I do the, if I do the, sh the shrinking at different rates, if I you know, say increase at one rate and then decrease at the other rate, then the derivative of the width disagrees on the two sides. So the width does not have to be uh, C1, even though it will be continuous. Okay, so this is a, um, okay, so now suppose 
Okay, so the width is continuous uh, as, um, on, on the, the, uh, as the metric changes. So now I'm going to allow the metrics to change under the mean curvature flow. So we start with something uh, convex, uh, closed convex hypersurface, and we, we flow it by the mean curvature. And then for each time uh, t, we have a width. Let's call that a function w of t. So uh, what we showed is that, that as time changes, the width is decreasing. And in fact, the derivative of the width is less than or equal to minus 2 pi. Well, I just told you the width wasn't differentiable. Um, so what do I mean? Well, here it's, it's in the sense of the limb soup of forward difference quotients. So in other words, if you have some positive h, and you look at the width at t plus h, minus the width at t, divide that by h, and take the limb soup as h goes to 0, that's less than or equal to minus 2 pi. This, of course, is enough to integrate. Okay, so since you integra can integrate this uh, sense of this bound on the derivative, that tells you the width at a, some future time t is less than or equal to the width at time 0 minus 2 pi t. Well, the width at time 0 is something, right? There's some bound for it. So this tells us that the extinction time is at most w of 0 over 2 pi. Um, the constants, so usually when I, I write this, uh, it, it, there, the 2 pi's are 4 pi's. The difference is that for in order to make the uh, mean curvature, the curve shortening flow, a gradient flow instead of twice the gradient flow, uh, we change the definition of energy by adding that factor of half in front. Just to explain that. Okay, so right. Right, 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 okay, so that gives an estimate on the extinction time. And now, if you had something that one of this long uh, shape, that, so it's very long but thin, then the width is bounded by how thick it is here. So for a shape like that, you get a, a much better estimate on the extinction time than you would by enclosing it in, in a large sphere. You can't. So basically, where, this, uh, where it comes from um, is you look what happens to, OK, so, so to estimate the width, uh, this Birkhoff stuff gives you a, geodes at a fixed time, gives you, basically gives you a geodesic realizing it. And you'd like to ask what happens to that length of the geodesic as you flow uh, forward in time. So you follow that geodesic under the, the, the uh, mean curvature flow. You apply, you know, that sits in the surface. You follow that curve under the mean curvature flow, and you see the length is, de is decreasing at a nice rate. And what that comes down to, what, that's where convexity comes in. You need to, to compare. So the, the rate of change of that geodesic, you get the, the geodesic curvature of that geodesic dotted with the mean curvature of the ambient surface. And that's at least as big as the square of the geodesic curvature. And that's where convexity is used, because all the eigenvalues of the second fundamental form have the right sign. If it's mean convex, then, then it doesn't necessarily work. It does work, say, if it's too convex or something like that. As long as you, but if you just know that the sum of the eigenvalues is the right sign, it doesn't work. Too convex in higher, or enough convex in higher dimensions. Let me say it that way. OK, so now we're, we're leaving convex, uh, mean curvature flow of convex hypersurfaces, and we're, we're going to the general case. And as I said, the, the, the goal is to try to get some kind of control over arbitrary singularities. Um, but again, or, or singularities for an arbitrary surface, where the surface now um, you know, maybe will be allowed to wiggle a little bit. Um, right, and so uh, Grayson's dumbbell showed you know, we can't, we're, we're not going to be able to reduce everything to the convex case. So uh, the key for analyzing singularities is a blow-up analysis. And this is very similar to the tangent cone analysis for minimal surfaces. So remember, the tangent cone analysis for a minimal surface, you, you focus on a point where there's a singularity. You take a sequence of rescalings of that point. So you, take what's a very, you look at that very small picture, and under a magnifying glass, you make it much larger. When you look at it under the magnifying glass, it's, because it's just a dilation of it, it's still a minimal surface, because those are dilation invariant. And there's a mon the monotonicity formula for area tells you that the area of the new thing is bounded by the area of the old, even after you scale it up, say, in a unit ball. So that uniform bound allows you to do, uh, use a compactness theorem to get something for which that monotonicity ra ratio is constant. So the limiting object is, a, is a, then a cone. And so now you analyze those minimal cones. The minimal cones are simpler. You've kind of reduced, because those are actually 
minimal surfaces, uh, if you intersect them with a sphere, it's a minimal surface in one dimension less. So you've reduced the complexity of the problem. So that tangent cone analysis allows you to improve things. We want to do a similar thing here. We imagine that you have a, a, a singularity of the mean curvature flow, at some, but now it's at a point in space and time. And we want to take a small neighborhood in space and time and scale it up to unit size and see what the picture looks like. So we're going to have to scale both space and time. The point, again, the, the key point in order to be able to get some limit that means something is we need some uniform control over these rescaling. So that's, there's going to need to be some monotonicity formula that allows us to pass to limits and, and get some meaningful limit. Okay, so I, let me explain that monotonicity formula now. So in order to do that, I need to remind you what the, the backwards heat kernel is. So the heat kernel, here we're on Rn cross R, is, is the fundamental solution to the heat equation. So if you apply the hot heat operator, to, uh, right, so this allows you to, by convolution with this, allows you to write all solutions to the, to the heat equation. So if we uh, fix the point y at the origin, you get this funny function, uh, capital phi here. So that's 4 pi t to the minus uh, n over 2 and e to the minus x squared over 4t in this case. Now imagine um, that I take this, this function and I integrate it over all of space at some fixed time. And I take the time derivative of that. Well, I just integrate under, di differentiate under the integral sign. I, I get the, the time derivative of, of, of that. But that then um, is just equal to the Laplacian, because it, or minus the Laplacian because of, uh, of the equation. Oh, I, by the way, I should say, notice here that for this phi, I reverse time. That then becomes a backwards heat kernel. And then by the uh, divergence theorem, if I integrate the Laplacian of something up over all of space, I get zero. Here I'm using the exponential decay, so there's no boundary term at infinity. So those integrals are actually constant in time. Of course, that function, as, as time goes to zero, this function is going to the delta function at the origin. So you can evaluate what that constant is. It's just one. OK, so now here's what uh, Huiskin did. He, he took. This, this same function, uh, but now he defined it on Rn plus 1. And now on a mean curvature flow, he integrates that uh, over the, the time t slice of the mean curvature flow, and now he gets a function of t. Okay, so this is like, like a Gaussian area, is a function of t. And the monotonicity formula is if you take the t derivative of this, you get a sign. So again, in Euclidean space, the t derivative of this would be 0. So in, uh, on a, a, but on a, a um, general mean curvature flow, you get this quantity on the right-hand side. So it's minus this, the integral of the square, again, against the weight. So this is perfect because it, it allows you, um, so this gives you, this monotonicity gives you control. Um, so on a large, this large scale control gives you con uh, control on all these smaller scales, which allows you to do this rescaling analysis and, and get limits. It also tells you on, um, it's also interesting to analyze the case of equality. So you get equality in this monotonicity formula precisely when h is equal to minus x dot n over 2t. Now when you if you stick in t equals minus 1, you see that's exactly the self-shrinker equation. So equality in this formula is exactly equivalent to having a self-shrinker. So these self-shrinkers are the mean curvature, analog, mean curvature flow analog of minimal cones. I should say there's a, uh, a local, OK, so there's something, uh, there's one thing that might be uh, unsa unsatisfying about this formula. Notice that this Gaussian weight that you integrate against, it's exponentially decaying, but you still need to do this integral over the entire space. OK, so it's not local. So uh, Klaus Ecker discovered a local monotonicity formula um, in 2001, which is uh, modeled on Watson's mean value formula for the heat equation. In, in that case, um, Ecker is able to, he integrates over, instead of just a slice of, of uh, you know, the whole sl time slice, he integrates over these heat balls, which are compact, uh, compact subsets of space and time. They don't live just in one time slice. They live in space and time, but they are compact. And as uh, it goes to zero, those heat balls converge to the point. OK, so next, um, parabolic scaling. 
So again, uh, thinking that we have our, our model of, of the tangent cone analysis for minimal surfaces, we'd like to take a small neighborhood of space and time and magnify what's happening in there to understand the singularity that's forming there. So the, uh, the right way to scale, so because this is parabolic, there's a, only one t derivative, whereas there are two x derivatives. So the, in, the chain rule tells us that if we apply, so because we, when we uh, apply the, the t derivative, the chain rule only brings out one factor, but the, the two x derivatives bring out two factors. So we have to scale by lambda in space and lambda squared in time. That's why the two fa uh, factors are different, because of the parabolic equation. And when lambda is large, this takes a, a small neighborhood of space-time and brings it back up to a, a unit-sized neighborhood. Okay, so what is a tangent flow? So you take this, given a mean curvature flow, and you take a sequence of la lambda i going to infinity, and you define a, a new sequence of flows uh, where you rescale by this lambda i. The monotonicity form formula gives uniform control over this sequence. So there's a uniform bound for the area, say in a unit ball, for this entire sequence of flows, or in any fixed set. So that uniform bound allows you to take measure theoretic limits. So you can get, a, say, a limiting bracky flow. Okay, so this flow, this limiting flow, is called a, uh, a tangent flow. And this limiting flow also is going to ha have equality in the monotonicity formula, so it's a self-shrinker. Okay, so this is the exact analog of how, when you, to, to understand singularities of, of minimal surfaces, you need to understand minimal cones. To understand singularities of mean curvature flow, you need to understand uh, these self-shrinkers. Okay, so often in the subject, there are two types of uh, rescalings that people do, depending on the singularity. That, that their singularities are divided into so-called type 1 and type 2 singularities. Um, but I, I won't really get into that, just to say that uh, this is more closely related to the type 1 analysis, but it applies in both cases. It's just that in the type 2 case, this limit uh, may not be uh, in the classical sense of convergence of flows. It, it, you may have to use bracky compactness. And here, of course, I've rescaled about the origin. You could do it about any point. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is a rough statement. So let me give the rough statement. This is the rough statement of the result that I want, uh, main result I want to talk about the uh, rest of the time. Um, so the self-shrinkers uh, that cannot be perturbed away are planes, spheres, and cylinders. So I've said that um, these numerical uh, pictures indicate that there are huge families of possible singularities. Uh, but none of these huge, none of these in the, in the families are generic. So, uh, say dynamically, or say dynamically stable, if you like. So that, uh, and so then, this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk also about an application of this, where, uh, okay, so you notice this, I'll state this theorem again precisely later, but just as, again, as a preview. Uh, this is actually uh, more, a statement of what we cannot do. It's, it's, a, it's the best possible positive spin on what we can't do. So here it says that generically, if a mean curvature flow becomes extinct in a compact point, then it does so in a round point. Of course, the other way of stating this is uh, we understand what happens at compact singularities, but not non-compact singularities. Okay, so how, what's the key for understanding um, so, so how, how do we show this, this generic result, that the only singularities that are, are stable, uh, dynamically stable, are these spheres, planes, and cylinders? So again, coming back to this uh, variational point of view, these self-shrinkers are critical points. We saw that these critical points for this Riemannian metric. So we'd like to understand the second variation. So these self-shrinkers are critical points. What's the index of this critical point? And that explains which ones, you know, again, for this ordinary uh, silly picture of flows, if you have this vector field, say, x, the, if you look at the function x squared plus y squared, uh, th that is a, an attracting critical point at the origin. But if you look at x squared minus y squared, the, that is an index 1 critical point at the origin, which uh, in probability 1 you will not hit. Okay, so I, what I want to show is that any other singularity other than spheres, planes, and cylinders, with probability 1, we won't hit. So in other words, though, the index of those critical points I want to be positive. It's going to be a little bit complicated to, to, to show that, 
uh, because it turns out that the index of every critical point is positive in, in, in the ordinary sense. But what that has to do with is this, these, um, these metrics, there's sort of a translation uh, invariance on them. Um, or rather, there's a, a, a lack of translation symmetry. And so it, at first analysis, it will appear that even the sphere is unstable as a critical point. On the other hand, Huygens' theorem says that if you start with any convex surface, you end up at a spherical singularity. So how can the sphere be unstable? The point is that if you wiggle the, uh, of course, if you wiggle the sphere a little bit, since it's convex, it's still convex. Okay, so we know it always ends up at a spherical singularity. So what, what explains that? What explains that is that the spherical singularity happens at a point of space-time. If you wiggle the sphere a little bit, the point where you get the, uh, the spherical singularity is moving around. We're going to have to, some, moving around in space and time. We're going to have to somehow mod out for that. Okay, so, um, right, so now instead of working with minimal surfaces, I'm going to work with this, this, what we call these f functionals, because it's easier to, with these to encode the, the, the dependence on the point and scale. So given a scale, so t0, it looks like a time, but it's actually a scale, t0 greater than 0, and a point x0 in, in space, look at the Gaussian integral centered at x0 on scale t0. So this is this f functional, f sub x0 t0 on a hypersurface sigma. And so this, of course, is closely related to the, the this is the, the function that which showed up in, in Huygens' monotonicity formula. But now the, the hyper, this hypersurface sigma is not moving in time. It's a fixed hypersurface. So uh, and let's, in order to make sure these integrals converge, let's assume that, that sigma has Euclidean volume growth. Any sort of polynomial or even exponential volume, volume growth for sigma will make these integrals converge because of the squared exponential decay. Um, and then, uh, just because we don't, uh, we, if possible, we prefer to write subindices. If, if I leave out, if I leave out the subindices, we'll just call it f uh, is the f01 functional. So that's centered at the origin and at unit scale. Okay, so this is a uh, a, a, a parametrized family of functionals on, on the set of hypersurfaces. So I'd like to take the the, the first derivative of this or first variation formula. So earlier we took the first variation formula for area. Now we're going to take it for, for these functionals. But I'd like to simultaneously vary all three things. So I'm going to take a one parameter family of surfaces, so sigma s, a one parameter family of points, x, s, and a one parameter family of scales. I'm simultaneously varying all three things. When I, and now I take the derivative at s equals 0. And here's the formula that we get. So um, an f, this function f, this is the variation of the surface. That's where I'm, I'm moving normally. So there are three terms in the formula, and all are integrated against this Gaussian weight. Um, the first term that shows up, so now let's imagine, imagine that we're at, oh, OK. So, so the first term, this vanishes if and only if we have a self-shrinker that is uh, uh, the t0 is the scale, and x0 is the point at which it's becoming uh, extinct. So this vanishes if and only if sigma is a self-shrinker that is going to become extinct at the point x0 at time t0 in the future. These other two terms are, are uh, sort of funny looking. Okay, so that's this first variation formula. Okay, so now, sort of a uh, neat fact is that uh, sigma is a critical point for, the, for this fun the f x0, t0 functional if and only if just the first term vanishes in the integral. Okay, so these, if this first term vanishes, the second two terms are going to drop out for free. We'll both vanish for free. So this means critical with respect to variation in all three inputs when I say critical point. Okay, why is this? So, if the first term vanishes, that means we have a self-shrinker. Um, let's imagine that x0 is equal to 0 and t0 is equal to 1, just to simplify things. So if the first term vanishes, it means that uh, uh, we have a self-shrinker here. Right? So 
But, but what do h, uh, so what variations in the point x0 and in the scale t0, what do those correspond to? Those are variations with the functional. But I could accomplish the, the same thing by varying the surface itself. The reason is, translating the point that I'm centering everything at, that's the same thing as fixing that point and translating the surface. Likewise, dilating, changing the scale at which I'm operating on, is the same thing as dilating the surface. But dilating the surface and translating the surface, those can be accomplished just by variations f of the surface. So if it's critical with respect to all variations of the surface alone, it must, the other two, it must be critical with respect to the other two things. Okay, so critical points in, uh, now where critical now means with respect to variations in all three parameters are exactly equal to self-shrinkers. Okay, so now we'd like to think of self-shrinkers as critical points of this functional and we'd like to understand them from that point of view. And we see already that they come with a, this built-in uh, problem that I've got this, this problem which comes from uh, varying uh, you know, the, the center and the scale. And we're going to have to deal with that. OK, so these self-shrinkers are critical points of this. The ordinary self-shrinkers, where you just have h equals x dot n over 2, those are critical points of the, the f01 functional. And we want to use these functionals to understand um, which, which self-shrinkers can be perturbed away. So um, from a dynamical point of view, the, the key to that, of course, is then to understand the Hessian of these functionals. And so what is the, so the second variation or, or the index of these functionals? This is probably a, a, a good place to stop. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Natasha? Where's Natasha? Uh, so if, suppose you have a convex uh, hypersurface. Uh, is there a nice integral form? Uh, which so starting an initial uh, hypersurface, is there some integral which tells you at which point it will become extinct? I'm sorry? In any dimension, or even in R3. Like a center of mass or something like that. Yeah, I don't know of one. Mike. Oh, Andre. I don't know. Natasha, is there one for curves? <laughs> no. Hey, Mike. Yeah, yeah. So for in, just so you can integrate by parts, imagine that f and grad f grow at most exponentially, say. In practice, we're only going to work with uh, bounded ones. I see. So does that have a, does that affect what you mean by genericity? So um, in fact, in R3, the perturbations which make it generic will all be compactly supported. I see. So that's, that's what the generality means. Yeah. Right. So what does it mean to be generic for something not compact? Right. Okay. That's right. In fact, we'll just, we can make a compactly supported perturbation, which makes it, uh, already kills it. So generic won't allow a lot of, it won't find things that are nearby that are, that have a very large sort of function. Right, right. Okay. Right. Uh, Matias. So the metals on R3 that turn the self-shrinkers into minimal surfaces, uh, is that Yes, yeah, that's right. And you would change it by translation with x0 and, and, and yeah. And it's, all, it's, it's for self-shrinkers that shrink to the origin in one unit of time. Yeah, so for instance, um, right, you can get some estimates on, on, on the point for which it shrinks to from things like that. That's right. For, so if give, suppose you're given a self-shrinker and you know it's a self-shrinker, 
but you don't know at which point in which time it disappears. Then there are integrals you can evaluate, which will tell you what point and what time. But starting with an arbitrary thing, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, I, let me think about it. I, I'm not sure. I didn't think about what the blowdowns are. I, okay, so as long as you have, let's say in R3, yeah, yeah. yeah and let's say it's embedded uh, and has, uh, you know, say Euclidean volume growth, yeah. right? In that case, uh, the blowdown will be a cone. So the link will be a smooth surface. Yeah, the link will be a uh, C. It will be a cone. I'm not sure that it will be smooth, but it probably should be, but I'm not sure of that. Yeah, Felix. Right. 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 That's right, even a cylinder you would, would blow down to a line. Yeah. Right. So it's not necessarily, it depends what you mean by smooth, but. So those should, yeah, th those, right, so the, bre so those usually are, you know, you get, uh, the, the shrink um, for negative time and then expanders for positive time. Um, and then those would, would not be generic. Can they, be interpreted they can, they can, they can, it, uh, separately. So that, yeah, that's right, to say the time minus one slice was a minimal surface for one metric, the time plus one slice is a minimal surface for another metric. Yeah. 